In the first year of the last decade of the 20th century, during my 30th year as a school teacher in Community School District 3, Manhattan, after teaching in all five secondary schools in the district, crossing swords with one professional administration after another as they strove to rid themselves of me, after having my license suspended twice for insubordination and terminated covertly once while I was on medical leave of absence, after the City University of New York borrowed me for a five-year stint as a lecturer in the Education Department, after planning and bringing about the most successful permanent school fundraiser in New York City history, after placing a single eighth grade class into 30,000 hours of volunteer community service, after organizing and financing a student-run food cooperative, after securing over a thousand apprenticeships, directing the collection of tens of thousands of books for construction of private student libraries, after producing four talking job dictionaries for the blind, writing two original student musicals, and launching an armada of other initiatives to reintegrate students within a larger human reality. I quit. I was the New York State Teacher of the Year when it happened. An accumulation of disgust and frustration which grew too heavy to be born finally did me in. To test my resolve, I sent a short essay to the Wall Street Journal titled, I Quit, I Think. In it, I explained my reasons for deciding to wrap it up, even though I had no savings and not the slightest idea what else I might do in my mid-fifties to pay the rent. In its entirety, it read like this. Government schooling is the most radical adventure in history. It kills the family by monopolizing the best times of childhood and by teaching disrespect for home and parents. The whole blueprint of school procedure is Egyptian, not Greek or Roman. It grows from the theological idea that human value is a scarce thing, represented symbolically by the narrow peak of a pyramid. The idea passed into American history through the Puritans. It found its scientific presentation in the bell curve, along which talent supposedly apportions itself by some iron law of biology. It's a religious notion. School is its church. I offer rituals to keep heresy at bay. I provide documentation to justify the heavenly pyramid. Socrates foresaw if teaching became a formal profession, something like this would happen. Professional interest is served by making what is easy to do seem hard, by subordinating the laity to the priesthood. School is too vital a jobs project, contract giver, and protector of the social order to allow itself to be reformed. It has political allies to guard its marches, and that's why reforms come and go without changing much. Even reformers can't imagine school much different. David learns to read at age four, Rachel at age nine. In normal development, when both are 13, you can't tell which one learned first. The five-year spread means nothing at all. But in school, I label Rachel learning disabled and slow David down a bit too. For a paycheck, I adjust David to depend on me to tell him when to go and stop. He won't outgrow that dependency. I identify Rachel as discount merchandise, special education fodder. She'll be locked in her place forever. In the 30 years of teaching kids, rich and poor, I almost never met a learning disabled child. Hardly ever met a gifted and talented one either. Like all school categories, these are sacred myths created by human imagination. They derive from questionable values we never examine because they preserve the temple of schooling. That's the secret behind the short answer tests, uniform time blocks, age grading, standardization, and all the rest of the school religion punishing our nation. There isn't a right way to become educated. There are as many ways as fingerprints. We don't need state-certified teachers to make education happen. That probably guarantees it won't. How much more evidence is necessary? Good schools don't need more money or a longer year. They need real, free market choices, variety that speaks to every need and runs risks. We don't need a national curriculum or national testing either. Both initiatives arise from ignorance of how people learn or deliberate indifference to it. I can't teach this way any longer. If you hear of a job where I don't have to hurt kids to make a living, let me know. Come fall, I'll be looking for work. <laughs>